We are in what is called the season of Easter. Easter itself was three Sundays ago. For the seven weeks after Easter, the readings will link in some way to the Easter story and the resurrection of Jesus. Our first reading is taken from the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament. This is a highly contested book. Some find in it explicit timetable for the days leading up to the end of the world when God wraps up the universe. However, there is a problem with that approach to revolution, revelation. Actually, there's several problems, but one is all for this morning. This is that for hundreds of years, some people have been interpreting revelation as predicting that the world is about to end. All of these predictions have come to nothing. So there's no reason to expect that the current crop of predictions will fare any better. Rather than force God to obey a human schedule, it's better to interpret Revelation in a way that gives it continuing relevance, linking it with its historical context and our contemporary context. Our reading for today comes from chapter 5. It's part of a vision of heaven taking place in the throne room of God. God is being praised by all manner of beings located around a crystal sea. Then a scroll is produced, a rolled up a length of paper, a scroll. The question is asked, who is worthy to open the scroll? And there's consternation among the assembled crowd until it is announced that someone called the Lion of Judah is worthy. However, no lion appears. Instead, there is a lamb. Actually, the word indicates a young lamb, one of those white fluffy things that bounce around the field. This lamb, though, also bears the marks of being crucified, which is quite a gruesome image. And then the throngs, bur throng bursts into praise. And our reader for this morning will read to us from Revelation 5. Reading from Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honour and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. On the one hand, the interpretation of this passage is pretty straightforward. The Lamb is Jesus, the marks of sacrifice are from crucifixion, and the appearance in heaven is the resurrection of Christ into glory. During the season of Easter, the hosts of heaven and people throughout space and time celebrate alongside us. However, there's another level of interpretation that can be applied to this vision. On the one hand, this other level might be said to be completely cliched and banal in our faith. On the other hand, it is earth-shattering, redefining human perspective and cultures. A lion is announced and a lamb appears, and not a very strong lamb at that. That simple substitution marks the need to readjust our understandings of status and power and glory. Power does not come through the physical strength and ferocity of a lion. It does not come through the exercise of the threat of a killer. Rather, power and glory, as God defines it, come through the silly friskiness and gentleness of a lamb. The author of Revelation wrote that over 1900 years ago and we still struggle to come to grips with what it means for our lives. Our next reading is from the Gospel according to St John. 
it's another last it comes from the last chapter in that gospel many think that this chapter is the later addition to the gospel an epilogue if you like in some ways it's an earthly counterpart to the reading from Revelation the risen Christ appears in the story but not as a glorious figure praised by all but in a low key way a stranger walking on a beach initially unrecognized and then Christ talks of the practice of leadership as being that of service and he serves the disciples breakfast as he does that again in the culture of the time the notion that an extremely powerful person of high status would make breakfast for others for those of lower status would be mind-boggling reading from John after these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias and he showed himself in this way gathered there together was Simon Peter Thomas called the twin Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples Simon Peter said to them I am going fishing they said to him we will go with you they went out and got into the boat but that night they caught nothing just after daybreak Jesus stood on the beach but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus Jesus said to them children you have no fish have you they answered him no he said to them cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some so they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter it is the Lord when Simon Peter heard it that it was the Lord he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea but the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from the land only about a hundred yards off when they had gone ashore they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread Jesus said to them bring some of the fish that you have just caught so Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish 153 of them and though there were so many the net was not torn Jesus said to them come and have breakfast now none of the disciples dared to ask him who are you because they knew it was the Lord Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish this was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead when they had finished breakfast Jesus said to Simon Peter Simon son of John do you love me more than these he said to them yes Lord you know that I love you Jesus said to him feed my lambs a second time he said to him Simon son of John do you love me he said to him yes Lord you know that I love you Jesus said to him tend my sheep he said to him the third time Simon son of John do you love me Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time do you love me and he said to him Lord you know everything you know that I love you Jesus said to him feed my sheep very truly I tell you when you were younger you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished but when you grow old you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go he said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God after this he said to him follow me in sacred words of old 
we have heard the Spirit speak in you. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that these human words may be the word of God for us this day, according to your promise through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. The passage we heard from the book of Revelation has this vision of the praise of God worthy of Cecil B. DeMille classic with myriads upon myriads of people and others singing eternal praise to God. Would you like to be among them? I wonder. I'm not too good at singing and I pity the person who would be standing next to me listening to me for all eternity. It would be a bit more like eternal punishment, I think. Perhaps members of the old Scots choir like Margaret and Kath would adapt better than me. But I wonder if many of us might find the vision a little too monotonous. We are so used to doing so many different things with our time. Fortunately, God has a plan B. And that emerges from the passage of the Gospel of John that we heard this morning. So. Let's leave flippant reflection on a cacophonous heavenly choir and come back to earth. Our reading presents a pragmatic side to the resurrected Jesus. The disciples had been through a pretty hectic few weeks. There'd been the journey to Jerusalem, the marvelous entrance on Palm Sunday, conflict with the authorities, the Last Supper, the arrest of Jesus, and the crucifixion. Then came the resurrection and a couple of encounters with the risen Jesus. In the passage we heard, we have to imagine that a few weeks have gone by. The disciples had left Jerusalem and made their way back to Galilee. Maybe it was cheaper to live there, and now that Jesus was no longer attracting large crowds, the disciples would be supporting themselves. Perhaps funds were running low. So Peter, the practical disciple, decides to go fishing. We shouldn't think of this as a, a bloke's way of getting away for some fun. Peter and many of the other disciples were, by trade, fishermen. So going fishing for them would be like going back to their old jobs, the trade they'd plied before Jesus came on the scene. It would have been a sign that everything was going back to the old normal. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. They'd fished all night with no success. Then a shadowy figure on the shore suggests that they try one more time with the net on the other side. The disciples don't recognize the person. They would have been tired from the long night's work. And I wonder if they might have thought that the helpful stranger had seen a school of fish in the dawn light from some hill nearby the shore before he'd walked onto the beach. At any rate, they're surprised to discover that their nets are filled with fish. They head back to the shore, and as they draw closer, they realize that the stranger is no stranger. It's Jesus. Peter jumps into the water to swim ashore. Frankly, I find that bit a bit odd since he and the boat arrive at about the same time. And it's also a bit odd that Jesus um, has a fish breakfast cooked and ready before the boat arrives with the fish. But setting these quibbles aside, the focus of the first part of our story falls on the miraculous catch of fish. Was this a miracle? The Gospel of John does not use the word miracle. Incidents like turning water into wine are called signs. In our gospel, the emphasis does not fall so much on the what of a miracle, but on the person it points to. Not what, but to what. The signs point to the meaning of Jesus. The story of the catch of fish in the last chapter of John's Gospel is one of surprising abundance. And so I wonder then if it is not a sign that leads us to realize that in resurrection there is abundance. 
In our culture, we tend to think in terms of scarcity and lack. To our minds, the failure of the fishing expedition that night would translate to a higher price for fish in the market. The rarer an item, the more it is worth. But that is not the case in the community of God, the kingdom of God. In the community of God, there is a resurrection abundance of things that bring life in all forms, an abundance of grace, of fellowship, of forgiveness, of hospitality, of welcome. Our story points towards that abundance. But it takes it one step further. Jesus had prepared breakfast for the disciples. In the introduction to the gospel reading, I mentioned how radical this was in the culture of the day. A person of superior status would not be a servant to others. Yet Jesus did just that. At the Last Supper, he washed the feet of the disciples and spoke to them about service. Now, after his resurrection, with all that glory that John attributes to him once he is resurrected, he is still acting in humble service. The abundance of the resurrection is the abundance of care that God lavishes upon us. By the lake, Jesus could have appeared as a shining and mighty figure, glowing in glory, surrounded by the hosts of heaven. And if he had done this, it would have been easy for the disciples to recognize him. Instead, Jesus chose to appear as a, a normal person, a common person person, someone whom it was hard to recognize from a distance. Jesus could have offered them a banquet, but chose a simple meal of fish and bread. Nothing ostentatious, but just what was needed. Resurrection abundance is the provision of what is needed in a low-key, humble, gentle way. Sometimes our encounters with God's abundance is a bit like that of the disciples. We are going about our mundane routine tasks when someone offers us help, a welcome, hospitality, an act of kindness. God may enter our ordinary day-to-day -day activities in a low-key way. And perhaps you can think of times in your lives when God was at work, but you didn't realize this because it seemed just to flow out of the situation. It only became apparent later. Well, let's get back to the gospel story. After breakfast, Jesus has a conversation with Peter. Three times Jesus asks Peter if he loves him and commands him to feed his sheep. What lies behind this threefold repetition? Commentators usually observe that on the night of the trial of Jesus, Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. They see a nice symmetry now. Peter acknowledges Jesus three times. It shows that Peter's forgiven and rehabilitated to God. Yet I wonder, certainly there is a balance, three denials, three professions of love, yet wouldn't once be enough? Forgiveness from God does not depend on the number of times we profess our love. The love of God flows out to us even before we ask. We don't have to beg for it. So I wonder, is there something else going on in the threefold repetition? The conversation between Jesus and Peter is linked to the miraculous catch of fish. It's linked to something like a sign, so perhaps it too is a sign. It points to something of the nature of faith in the resurrected Jesus. Jesus repeats the question and command three times. Once is enough to cover the denials of Peter. So I wonder if the other two are for the future, sort of being put into the future bank account of Peter. The repetition is a way of indicating that the call to service goes on forever in our lives. Those other two repetitions cover those times in the future when Peter messes up again, when he's tempted to go back to his old ways, to deny Jesus, tempted not to care for others but to 
to go fishing. At the start of the story, Peter and the other disciples are, were about to go back to their old occupations. By the end of the story, that is impossible. Peter cannot go back to being a fisherman. He must go forward to take a role caring for other people, like a shepherd caring for sheep, just as Jesus cared to him and for the other disciples. Caring with acts like the ones they have just received, a simple, timely breakfast. God's welcome and God's hospitality is not something we can keep to ourselves. Once we have received it, we must go out and share it with others. God's hospitality changes us. When we have wel been welcomed by God, we cannot go back to the way we were. Like Peter, we must leave things behind, good things, a pile of valuable fish, and bad things, like the memory of denying Jesus. And then we can go forward to welcome and show hospitality to others. And if we slip up, then the dogged repetition of the question and command of Jesus comes into play to remind us that regardless, we must continue to care because we care for Jesus. Jesus, the one who feeds us, is also the one who constantly calls on us to feed his sheep. On that night of the trial, Peter was warming himself by a fire when someone asked him if he knew Jesus. He denied it three times. On that evening, the fire that Peter stood at was a fire of isolation, of fear, of persecution, a fire of rejection and denial. And in our world, far too many people live and warm their lives by such a cold fire. Then came the resurrection. By the Sea of Galilee a few weeks later, Peter once again stood by a fire. On that fire were fish and bread, the staples of life. The fire was the warmth of God's love for us and for the world, a warmth that brings healing and community, acceptance, not denial, and no fear. We are asked to, we, we are tasked with living by the light of that fire and sharing its warmth with all we meet. Sometimes we may do this well, sometimes not so well, but again and again, in service, in success or in failure, the words of Jesus ring in our ears, feed my sheep. Amen.